All right, uh, so I'm Justin from Julia in Belgium. So I just had a question right now, uh, if I'm gonna introduce a little bit uh, open telemetry before. So yeah, so I will give a little bit of the background here before jumping into what cross layer telemetry is and how we implement it. And um, so, yeah. Looks like I cannot switch slides anymore. This was a test. Computer scientist, right? So um, if you don't know about this, well, you probably woke up from a 10 years coma, right? But um, you, we went from monolithic architectures to kind of microservice architectures, right? And that brings a lot of advantages such as the flexibility. So you have more flexibility, you have high reliability, and you can deploy things independently, right? Um, but you have also a lot of other advantages and other uh, disadvantages. And the main one here is that you have problems to debug, right? So if you take the drawing on the slide, you see that it's still quite a small topology, but you start having a lot of, you know, relationships here and there, maybe even circular dependencies. So it starts to become a little bit harder to, to debug if there is a problem. But this one is actually fine because you might end up with something like this. And yeah, you can love, but actually I, I'm sure it exists. And so if you end up with something like this and someone asks you to debug it, I wish you good luck. Um, Actually, you have to use the right tool in that case, right? And so the right tool here is just a good application performance management. So its pretty name is APM. And in this specific context, we will rely on distributed tracing, okay? And so for that, there is a new uh, standard which is called open telemetry. So I don't know if any of you know that. I know that there is someone that knows actually. Hello. <laughs> so this is actually new because it's a merge between open tracing and open census. Um, and so the goal was to gather everything in one place. It provides APIs, it provides entities to be uh, able to trace. So you have entities for the old trace chain. And so how does it work? So you have your application right here that uses the open telemetry library, okay? And so the open telemetry library is used to tell the, the, the application which part of the code you want to monitor. So as soon as the part that you want to monitor is executed, the trace, so the result, is handled by the collector from open telemetry. And then you will, it will send it to a backend. So the backend is actually the whole part over here. And here I will use Jaeger as, as an example, but you have to know that you have also other alternatives. So here to the collector, which is a Jagger collector that will process the data and store the traces in the database. And so what you see right here after the database is just uh, a web application. So very useful for administrators. This is the data visualization. So if you are the admin and you want to give a look at the traces that were generated, you just use that and so it's very fine. Two important notions in this world. So you have the notion of trace and the notion of span. A span, you can see that as one or several instructions in your code that you want to monitor, okay? And you can actually develop a kind of hierarchy here. So a root span can have child, a child span and a child span can also have a child span, et cetera, et cetera. So what, it, what is it instant, sorry, what, which is it inst, whoa, this is the morning, okay? What is interesting here is that when you have nested functions and also nested services, so a service that calls another service, et cetera, et cetera, you can see the whole flow of your code. So it's far more easier to debug. And a trace is actually a set of spans. So pretty simple. So let's just have an example to illustrate. I define an API called generate PDF and I generate 
a root span called generate PDF, so for the API, right? And what it does here is that first it checks for permissions, whatever that means, and then it gets a PDF. Okay, so we have two children. The first child is for the check permissions function, and the other one is for the get PDF function, okay? And so the data visualization tool I was talking about is this one. So this is the Jagger tool here. And so it's not that clear on the slide, but the root span is here. So this is the generate PDF and you have the time taken for the whole thing. And then you can have the time taken separately for each subspan. So for the check permissions, we took a little bit more than one millisecond. And the get PDF one, we took a little bit more that I don't see that on the slides, but it's like a little bit more than three millisecond, right? So in that example, we could assume that check permissions and get PDF are two simple functions and that they are like local jobs, right? But yeah, this one is for cat lovers. So. so what now if what we want to monitor uses the network? So for instance, an HTTP request or an HTTPS request, whatever, as long as it uses the network, right? Let's just have an example then. So I have a dumb API for login as an example. What I do here is that I send a request and I wait for the response. So the span is with the response included in that case, all right? So I look at the the trace in the data visualization app, and we see that the time is reported as a little bit more than one and a half millisecond, okay? But now, since such, such tool is application level, right, so you at best have from layer five to layer seven uh, information, what if there is a lower level issue? So in that case, we will sim simulate a delay by mimicking a congestion right here on one of the ingress interface of uh, one of the router on the path. And so if we look at the code, uh, at, the, at the data visualization, the visualization now, the good news is that the time taken is reported. So you see the increase right here, but actually you don't have that much. So if you develop this trace, you have some informations, but not actually why and what is the problem exactly. So if you are the admin, you see that, you say, okay, I will check the app, I will check the server, I will check the database, I will check everything that could be the problem. And after each part, you will find nothing. So maybe it's a network issue in that case, right? And so this is, this is really a problem because if you are facing such issue, you will waste a lot of time and so time is money. And basically, like two, two days ago, I spoke with someone that was in the same situation, and he told me, oh, man, if I had this, I could have you know, spared some time. So I, I think it's very useful. And so this is actually what we want to improve with cross-layer telemetry. This is where it enters the stage. So you can s describe cross-layer telemetry as something that makes the entire network stack, so from layer two or three up to layer seven, visible to such tool. Okay, and this is very interesting because I, as I mentioned, this is only usually application level. So you only have information from layer five up to layer seven. So how does it work? We need several pieces actually. The first one is this blue box with CLT written inside, okay? So this is a client library, a little bit like the, the open telemetry one. And we use, so the application will use that library to pass the trace ID and the span ID to the kernel. Why do we need that actually? Because the goal is to, you know, collect telemetry data over the entire path and then correlate the telemetry data back to the original trace. And so to, for the correlation, we need the two, okay? So we have, the library that will pass the span through a netlink call, okay? And it will annotate the socket with the ID. So this is the corresponding socket. So basically the function here uh, needs a trace ID, a span ID, and a socket file descriptor. We use IOM actually to, 
to, to, to, to transport telemetry data here. Um, and so at the end, we need some agent to listen to the traffic. Here it's an IOM agent, obviously, because we use IOM here. So it will gather telemetry data collected by IOM, and it will also grab those two guys. And data will be transmitted to a collector, which is obviously an IOM collector in that case, right? And this is actually here that the magic happens because you actually reference this very exact pan and you enhance it with the telemetry data received here, okay? And so you send it back to the backend collector, which is the Jaeger collector in that case, and the enhanced pan will be stored in the database. So this is an attempt for a patch. The, the, actually, this is a straightforward one for now. So what we do is that we add two fields in both the SOC structure and the SKBF because we need the trace and the span IDs in both. So this is like 1 and 28 bits and 30, 64 bits. We also add a netlink call to pass the IDs from user space. So this is basically what the, the library, so if I go back to this slide, this is what will be used here, okay? And the handler for this netlink call will just copy the IDs to the corresponding socket structure. Then, actually, we want to copy IDs from the socket structure to the SKB itself. And actually, it happens as soon as the, here, as an example, is the HTTPS request. As soon as, you know, a new SKB is picked up from the pool, you would just take the IDs that were copied inside the socket and you would put it on the SKB itself. The reason for this is that initially, in a previous version, we were only copying, you know, trace and span IDs on the socket. But the problem was that if you had some packets queued here and another trace arrives, you would erase the previous trace and span IDs and so you would have a mismatch between packets and IDs, okay? So what we did is that we implemented that in the TCP part, but we could do that for UDP if needed. And so finally, we insert IDs within IOM. So this is a temporary solution because what we did is that we kind of hack the, the, uh, the, the header of IOM to include both IDs. Uh, I'll go back to that later for uh, a better solution. But right now, so IOM is already in the kernel and uh, it uses the lightweight tunnels API, right? So what we do is that we insert IDs uh, at that time. So yeah, I like to call it open telemetry and Niagara on steroids because actually now you have some useful information in the trace. So if we take this example, you have clients, could be mobile phones or whatever, so you contact the API here and you have your domain, which is really simplified just again for the example, okay? This guy, without CLT, so cross-layer telemetry, it would not be here, okay? So you would have the simple example where you send a trace, or you send a request, sorry, and then part of your code is traced, the request is sent, the response comes back, code is executed, the trace is sent to the collector and is stored in the database, and then the administrator could have a look at it. Now with CLT, just remember, we have the uh, application um, client for open telemetry and also for cross layer telemetry used here. We have an IOM agent running on the other side and we have this guy, okay? So what we do here is that we take the same example as previously and we introduce some congestion here with TC, so we simulate a delay here. And again, we look at the data visualization. So as usual, you see that it took some time and now you have some IOM data, okay? So the first line here corresponds to the entry point. And I don't know if you can see that, but here I ask IOM to, to insert the queue depth. So the queue depth is basically when a packet is sent out, this is the current length of the, date of, of the, the interface, so the queue, okay? So this guy will insert it, this guy will insert it, and so for each hop on the path. So you have to configure your IOM domain for that as well. I didn't mention that, but. It's quite easier, actually. So the, the second line is for the rotor here. And so what we see here is that the, the Q depth value has increased. 
So obviously now the administrator can see that there is something going on on that interface, right? Because the QDEF has increased. And so now, unless that you don't know what you're doing, you will gain a lot of time because you know the problem, so it's up to you to solve it. Okay, so in that, in that case, you could just rebalance the queue or whatever. We run some basic test performance to, just to make sure that it was on the right track. So the first one here on the left is divided in four parts. Each part is one minute long. So the first part here, we run a normal situation, so just normal traffic. The second minute, we introduce congestion. The third minute, we enable CLT. And the last minute, we go back to normal situation. So we remove the congestion and we disable again CLT. And what we observe is that there is absolutely no difference between those two. So it might be that CLT is efficient, but actually, since there is a congestion, it means that there is also less traffic. So that's why actually we run this test as well to make sure that it was quite efficient. So now we did not introduce congestion. So it, there, is, there are only three parts. The first minute is the normal situation. Second minute, we enable CLT. And the, the, the third minute, we disable CLT, so we are back to normal. And so what we see is that it's quite the same. Maybe you could see here a little bit more dots that in the normal situation. So the overhead that you see here might be uh, due to IOM, because if I go back to um, here, IOM has to insert data on each hop. And so it was actually measured in another paper. So I think it's still quite good. So from a performance point of view, it's still on the right track, I think. And so last but not least, um, we are actually trying to push something in the IETF. So recently, um, in the six-man working group, so this is all IPv6 related, we had two presentations, uh, not me, but some people, uh, for two drafts, two different drafts, and they were trying to define new options in the uh, by hop destination registry, okay? Um, and the draft was trying to allocate a new code point. But the thing is, their use cases were pretty similar, right? So the feedback they got from the meeting in July was that um, there were some concern to, to waste some code points quickly because you know if one guy needs to carry a 32-bit IDs uh, and the other one a 64-bit ID or two guys need the same ID, well, you would waste a lot of code points quickly and you don't know what the situation will be in five, 10 or 20 years. So actually the ID come to mind right after uh, the meeting to write this draft um, so this is basically a generic identifier uh, carrier for, IP, uh, for IPv6 packets. And should this draft be accepted by uh, the working group, so I will present it next week in London, um, and should it go further, I think it could be a potential solution for CLT standardization and so to avoid using you know, IOM and hack the current header to, to carry the IDs. But we could still, we should still use both at the same time in the packet. So we would have an option carrying the trace and span IDs. And next to that, we would have the IOM option carrying, you know, each hub telemetry data. So to conclude on that, I think that it's useful. So it's not because I'm the speaker, but I, I spoke with people that told me it's useful. So I think it's useful. Um, so my question to you is that, do you think, is there any interest to have support for that in the kernel? I think it's the best place to ask. And if so, could you maybe give me some feedback on the patch design? Because I don't know if it's on the right track or if you see a better solution, which could be more cleaner or more performant. I don't know. So I'm more here. And... I don't know why the last slide did not display, but well, this is the end. So I'm finished. Thank you. We have an AI system. <laughs> Our AI system has installed a fade to black on the last slide. That's All right. Comes. <laughs> Any questions? 
thoughts. So I, I mean, okay. Well, just looking at the description of what your high level patch design is right off the bat, I can see the biggest issue would be adding anything to the SK yeah. buff. That's always going to be a pulling teeth type thing. So that's most likely going to be your biggest issue with all that. In addition, it becomes a matter of once you start crossing namespaces, would those fields be expected to be retained or should they be wiped out? And so a lot, I could see a lot of that becoming an issue as you go, especially if that and on top of it, then you socket to socket communication, it becomes okay, who technically owns the ID if you have two sockets in the same system that you're trying to communicate with. So in, in terms of all that, having the data in the IPv6 header would probably, if you're wanting to have something that's supposed to span the network, that would make more sense than trying to get it into the SK buff. Yeah, so I was going to say something similar, which is I, I can see a lot of value here, but I don't think the answer can be instrument every kernel data structure that you're looking for, right? I mean, today you're looking for a packet, but tomorrow it may be something else. Maybe if you really want end to an application tracing, it's not just a network tracing issue, right? So, so a more a thought that came to mind, which may not be practical, would be to try and build something on top of perf tracing or something and pull data back out to user space and then stick it from there. Because like, I mean, I, there are some things you won't get directly, but it may be easier to get trace points in than to get data structures added. I don't know. Thoughts, yeah. Well, yeah, because if nothing else, if you're just going to be adding trace points, then it just comes a matter of taking a look at the SKB and say, okay, are you pointing to my socket? Or, yeah, if, you're, if so, then I'll go ahead and do the tracing. Cause, so you don't even have to technically store anything in the socket itself. It'd be just a matter of tracing which socket you want the info on and then just do a lookup on the SKB. And as long as it's pointing to that socket, go ahead and do your trace action. on the bridge. Well, in that case, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We are in break till lunch now, right? We are in break till lunch. Uh, then we have our last talk, and then we have some interns talking about some internship programs, and then the most awaited talk of the evening, the closing ceremony. He will do a handstand. <laughs> <laughs>